strategy would be, we just go to the office of Senator Chuck Schumer, and he makes the time for us, and he tells us, and he makes sure how things pass. It was his critical support of the Corker Menendez bill, like Senator Menendez just mentioned, was talking about his bill, that led us to get the leg up and to know that Congress will have the responsibility to vote the President's sanctions bill up and down. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, friend, it's a true pleasure to introduce our show mayor, Yisrael, Senator Chuck Schumer. Yeah, okay, first, welcome. It's always good to see you. I'm here every year, and I very much appreciate you being here. Um, I wanted to talk a lot of topless about Iran, but I'm not going to do that because you're building the whole thing. And um, some things should be said uh, in the Mishbucha. Um But let me say a few things here. First, the decision about Iran say two things to you, and some of them you may not like to hear. The decision about Iran is the most serious, one of the most serious decisions I've had to make in the 41 years that I have been an elected official. And it's, it's, as Prime Minister Netanyahu says, an existential threat to Israel. Hezbollah can do lots of damage to Israel. Hamas can do lots of damage to Israel. They can't destroy its existence. But if, God forbid, a nuclear weapon were to be exploded over Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Hydra, a million would die and everyone else would leave. And so the millennium-old dream of the Jewish people to have a homeland in Eretz Yisrael, now 67 years old, would be gone. So it truly is an existential threat to Israel. It's also a terrible threat to the United States. Because while it may not be an existential threat to the United States, if Iran were to get a nuclear weapon, first, it would change the whole balance of power in the Middle East and give Iran much more power, particularly in the arenas of Yemen and Syria and places where the Sunnis and, the, uh, and Iraq where the Sunnis and Shiites are fighting. But second, the odds are all too high that the Sunni nations, the so-called moderate nations there, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and UAE, would try to get a nuclear weapon. Saudi Arabia has already said it. And they have a willing seller in their fellow Sunni Muslim state of Pakistan. Pretty clear that Pakistan sold the weapon to North Korea. One of the heroes in Pakistan, which still amazes me, is Dr. A.Q. Khan, who not only developed the Pakistani nuclear weapon, but sold it to North Korea. And he's a hero there, and you can be sure it will be sold. If all these countries have a nuclear weapon, the odds of a nuclear conflagration occurring in that part of the world are too high. And if it were to occur, it would hurt us. Because it would hurt us directly as individuals. Because the radioactivity, strontium-90 and everything else would get in the atmosphere, the wind blows it around the globe, and it would get in our lungs. And the odds are that some of our lives would be short. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very bad thing. Okay? I'm trying to do a hierarchy here. I have to be brief. So that's the worst solution. Now, the next worst solution is a military strike against uh, Iran. Why? Well, first, we don't know how successful it will be. Second, there is such a thing, asymmetric power. The Iranians would, would in all likelihood, try to direct terror, not only at Israel, but at the United States. And they might succeed. And at the very minimum, it seems to me, that they would direct Hezbollah to send tens of thousands of rockets to Israel in response. Tens of thousands. And while the Hamas rockets into Israel didn't do much damage last year, there's a big difference. A, Hezbollah has more rockets. B, 
Hezbollah has more accurate rockets. C, Hezbollah is closer to the population centers, you know, southern Lebanon where they are, is closer to the population centers of um, Tel Aviv, Yerushalayim, Haifa. And so if they sent 10,000 rockets and Iron Dome did its job and it's darn good, you'd have a much higher, a much greater likelihood that some of those rockets would get through. The reason most of the Hamas rockets did no damage, some of it was Iron Dome, but much of it was they were inaccurate. They landed in, on stones and in cornfields and places like that. So the odds are tens of thousands of Israelis could die if Hezbollah sent rockets and so. Those who are all saying, nice and easy, let's have a military solution, are not looking at the facts. And as a Jewish leader in America, I have to look at the facts. And there are people both on the hard left and the hard right who like to see their ideology come first. And I will not be pushed around on this issue by the left, by the right, by party, have to do what's right for the United States above all and for Eretz Israel second. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, the best solution is a, an agreement that everybody likes. That both President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu and all the Europeans and the whole world says this is a great agreement. The likelihood of that happening is small. You can point fingers at blame, but it's small. So the choice we face is this. Which is better? No agreement or an agreement that is not close to the idea? Right? And to me, there's not a clear-cut answer because each is fraught with peril. Let's go to the, uh, one of the points I wanted to make. Something to understand, which I tell everybody. One reason there is such a divergence of view, and I'm sure you sit there and say, why doesn't the world see this the way, the way we see it? Here's why. Let us say there's an agreement that has a 95% chance of making sure there's no nuclear or not. Okay? 95%. Let's just say that hypothetically. If you are the President of the United States, President of an American, an average American, you say, that sounds pretty good to me. But because a nuclear Iran is an existential threat to Israel, if you're Prime Minister of Israel or an Israeli citizen, or for that matter, an American Jew, or at least some American Jews, many, you say, I can't live with a 5% chance that Israel will be wiped out. And so there's a basic difference in viewpoint that even if everyone was getting along famously with one another and there were no bad blood and there were bad words on both sides and mistakes on both sides, the United States and Israel in my opinion, you'd still have a different viewpoint. It's something to be very mindful of. We American Jews, particularly me, my group, who had ancestors here before World War II, feel this particular. Because the American Jewish community ignored the threat of Hitler, or pushed it aside, oh, don't worry, nothing bad will happen. He's a maniac. Some people say that about Hamani. He'll never bomb, don't worry, he's just a maniac. You should have bought it. And of course, look what happened. And the double shame of it, of course, was that many of the American Jewish community deliberately kept quiet because they were afraid of being accused of dual loyalty. So there's a book about this. The New York Times, owned by a Jewish family, deliberately had a policy of not writing about the initial acts of depravity against the Jewish community in Germany in the early 30s, when Hitler first took power in the mid-30s, because they didn't want to be accused of dual loyalty. Okay. But the 95-5 thing is something that's very important, I think, for people to understand. Okay. Gotta close the door. 
Um, okay. So this is the topless part of my dissertation. So what's better? An agreement that is not close to the ideal or no agreement. Well, here's the no agreement side. The no agreement side is if we don't have an agreement, A, the sanctions will continue with Senator Menendez with my help and the help of others. We've written a law that says if there's no agreement, sanctions get revved up. Now there's a big if there. Will everyone else participate in sanctions? And make no mistake about it. While the United States' sanctions are the toughest and most important, if the Europeans leave, and it so bothers me to have the Jewish fate in European hands, people say, oh, we have to please the French and the Germans and the British. And I tell them, we've been through this before, we Jewish people, of leaving our fate in the hands of Europeans. I've said this to other groups. Anti sentiment, I've said it to non Jewish groups. You know the way racism, anti black sentiment is deep in America? Thank God there's not the same level of anti Semitism as we were close to. And America is a very good country for the Jews. The level of anti Semitism in Europe is comparable to the racism in America. And um, so putting things in the Europeans. But having said that, if there's no agreement, there's a chance the Europeans bolt, the Russians bolt, the Chinese bolt, and then you have other countries that want oil, Korea, Japan, India, they leave. They start dealing with Iran because they have all these companies and economic interests that want to deal with Iran. The sanctions may not be successful, but let's assume they stay good. Because our sanctions law, when we toughen it up, is pretty tough and it says if you deal with Iran, you can't deal with American financial institutions. And that's a pretty strong stick. Okay? People will try to get around it. So let's assume everyone stays on board. Okay? Number one. And two, let's assume the other good thing that will happen. The Saudis continue to keep the price of oil low. The Saudis, the one good thing in all this that has happened, the Saudis, the Egyptians, and the CC is very good. That's one of the very good things that's happening. So much better than uh, <laughs> Mubarak even was, and certainly than Morsi. But in any case, these four countries um, now realize that their greatest enemy is not Israel, but Iran. And they are more willing now to deal with Israel and not make Israel a pariah state. Very, very important for the future, but not for the moment. But in any case, the Saudis, when they know that Iran is their enemy, keeps the price of oil low. And make no mistake about it, the reason Iran or Saudi has kept the price of oil low is not West Texas and the price of oil. They can live with whatever price of oil. They make a fortune. It's to bring Iran to its knees, number one, and second, to bring Russia to its knees. Not that they hate Russia so much, but Russia is fully supporting Syria, another state there, okay. So all that continues. The positive theory is this. That continues for another year. The sanctions bite in harder, and the Iranians say, okay, we'll come to a good agreement, the ideal solution, one that we would all support. That could happen. And you know, as you know, I publicly opposed the president on the interim agreement, and I still believe I was right to do it because you don't reduce sanctions. Sanctions have to go up and up and up so the Iranian people feel it's going to keep getting worse. <laughs> unless, unless they come to a real agreement, okay? People were mad at me for that, the White House and others. Same with the Corker Bill. I have no doubt what I did with the Corker Bill, and um, one of the reasons it got passed is, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. There's so much to say here, I'm leaving a whole lot out. Um, so let's assume that's all good, right? That's the good scenario. But there's a bad scenario. Let's say all everything I said happened. Iran keeps the price, gets, uh, Saudi keeps the price of oil, all the allies stay. 
How do we know the Iranians won't say, all right, we're in such economic trouble, we're going to build the bomb right now and threaten to use it? Okay. They can, we know that. Under the present situation, everything's on hold, but they can start revving it up and do it in three, four months. And you know, how do we know what's the answer? Nobody knows. That's the problem. So you could have the default position that no agreement leads to the worst thing in nuclear Iran. And no one knows. I will be getting briefings, I have to get, on the psychology of comedy. See what he might do? To come to a judgment. Okay. Now let's take the other case. A agreement that is hardly ideal. Well, what, we don't know what the agreement is. Let me just say this, and I'll go through it. The good, the, one of the best things about Corber is we'll get to see it in writing 30 days before we have to vote on it. I will know all the answers to the questions I'm going to give you in a minute, but I don't know them now because there's no agreement. And I have to tell you, the day Prime Minister Netanyahu came out, the day after the interim thing was said, set him against him, because then no one thought he was, he should have said, I have five or 10 questions and I'm gonna judge it on whether they have these questions answered. But here are the unanswered questions. First, what are the inspections like? Okay, can the US unilaterally go inspect anywhere, anytime, you can't say immediately, but say 24 hours notice. 24 hours doesn't give enough time. Let's say Iran starts to build something in Shiraz, which is a religious city that hasn't had any nuclear, and we suspect it. How quickly do we get it? No one knows. We haven't seen an agreement yet. Second question. What makes the sanctions be lifted? Okay. The Iranians say they're lifted the day the agreement is signed. We all know the folly of that. If the, the sanctions are lifted the day they sign it, they sign it, and then they ignore it a day later and start building a bomb. And the sanctions are lifted. Now the US says, because I have had, I have 14 pages of questions. I have had five briefings that lasted over an hour each with the top people. Kerry, Sherman, their staffs. I'm only up to five, five page, page five of my questions, but in this one they answered, they said the Iranians have quietly agreed that there are two pages of conditions they must complete before sanctions are lifted, including things like the dismantlement of the plutonium reactor in Iraq, Iraq, A-R-A-K, uh, going down to the 5,000 centrifuges rather than the 14, destroying the ways to make new advanced centrifuges, things like that. I don't know what the answer is, but that's very important. Third, let's say the sanctions are lifted. What is the snapback provision? How do you get the sanctions back? Now some will say, and they may be right, we'll never get them back. Once the Europeans start uh, trading with them, they'll never do it back. But at least when you look at the agreement, again, we need the allies to agree with us? Do we need the UN to agree with us? Or can it happen that the US itself determines that the provisions ought to snap back, and then how quickly and how soon do they snap back? Okay. Fourth, Iran has unequivocally said four or five times recently this week, Comedy said, on the military sites there will be no inspections and we can do whatever we want. That's our military. Unacceptable. Parchin, one of the big military sites where there has been some nuclear stuff, is almost the size of Rhode Island, from what I understand. They could do everything on there, and if we can't look at it, they can, and it's, the agreement says you're okay to do it, terrible. And finally, fifth, and there are many more. Oh, and part of these sanctions is what happens to the $100 billion that's now sitting there because of sanctions? Does it go immediately back to Iran? Does it go little bits at a time while they're still with the agreement? Nobody knows. And finally, 
they had agreed, and they say they agree, that the 10,000 kilograms of advanced uranium, which could be turned into a nuclear weapon, goes down to 300. But originally they were saying, you read the newspapers, that they'll send it all to Russia to be made into fuel rods, which means it can't be made into a bomb. And now they've backed off that, but they haven't said what they do with it. So we don't know the answers to any of these questions, but the one belief I have there is, and even though it got a lot of my own party and my own president mad, I'm glad we have the Corker Amendment so we will know the answers to these before any determination is made. But here's the bad part of that. Okay? Let's say the Iranians are duplicitous. And remember what they are. They have executed 120,000 Iranians since they've started. This is hardly a nice group. And so let's say they, they say, okay, we'll go along, sanctions will be lifted, and then we'll build the bomb. So those who argue that no sanctions will certainly lead to a good road, and those who argue that a less than ideal agreement will certainly over speech or overstating the case. Here's what I'd say to you in conclusion. As I said, this is the one of the most important decisions that I will ever make. As an American, as well as somebody who tries to be a showman. And I'm spending much time on this. I'm talking to everybody, obviously, to the administration and the Prime Minister of Israel. I'm talking to um, some very smart people on the other side, Uji Herzog and uh, Yadlin, who's going to be the defense minister, who's very smart about these things. He's the guy who the pilot who bombed Osiris, you know, the reactor in uh, Syria, Iraq. I spent some time with Dr. Kissinger. I'm spending time with experts. It's a serious decision. And when I have learned, I've been an elected official 41 years, some of you know that because you knew when I was elected 24, 23 years old in Flatbush. Are you going to make that when you have the toughest decisions, you don't let politics interfere? You don't let party interfere? You don't let pressure interfere? You do the right thing as best you can. And that's, that's my promise to you. Assure you that that's what I will do. And it's momentous times, ladies and gentlemen. Momentous, momentous times. And the more I learn, the more I'll tell you. And once the agreement's out, we'll be able to talk about what's in it. Until that time, I'm going to find out as much as I can.